In 2022, the world was plunged into mourning by the unexpected demise of Queen Elizabeth II, the youngest female monarch to be crowned in British royal history. On September 8th, the solemn declaration from Buckingham Palace officially signaled the conclusion of the reign of this esteemed queen. While the news of her death is widely known, the intricate narrative concealed behind the regal doors holds untold secrets and conflicts. Delve into the mysterious story encompassing internal discord and tensions among the Fab Four. Your curiosity will not be in vain as we unravel the enigmatic tale in its entirety. Stay with us until the conclusion, ensuring you don't miss a single poignant moment. Queen Elizabeth II's decline and eventual passing marked a somber and unexpected chapter in British history. Despite meticulous planning for what was metaphorically called the Fall of London Bridge, the reality of her death on Thursday, September 8th, a year ago, at Balmoral Castle in Scotland, unfolded with a speed that even those closest to her had not anticipated. The unexpected nature of her decline became evident in the midst of a day filled with royal family tension and a frantic race against time to reach Balmoral. The codename London Bridge alluded to the carefully devised plans for the Queen's eventual demise, plans that had been in place for years. However, when the moment arrived, it caught both her family and the nation largely unprepared. On that poignant day, only two of her children, Prince Charles, who is now king, and Princess Anne, were fortunate enough to be by her side. The rest of her children and grandchildren found themselves scattered across various modes of transportation, desperately attempting to bridge the distance that separated them from their beloved matriarch. Prince Charles and Princess Anne had, by a stroke of good fortune, been in Scotland in the days leading up to her passing. Both managed to make it to her bedside just a few hours before she breathed her last. Princess Anne, in an ironic twist of fate, had spent the night at Balmoral on Wednesday. However, on Thursday morning, she left the castle to fulfill a prior engagement at nearby Blair Gowrie, attending an event for the riding for the Disabled Association. In a turn of events that underscored the urgency and emotional upheaval of the situation, she was summoned back midway through the engagement. As one family friend shared with the Daily Beast, Everyone knew intellectually that she could die at any moment, but on Wednesday, no one expected her to die on Thursday. The apparent contradiction between the Queen's recent good spirits and her sudden demise added to the shock. Over the weekend preceding her passing, she had been in such good form that her advisors deemed it appropriate for both outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson and incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss to journey to Balmoral on Tuesday, September 6th, for the official handover of power. A photograph capturing the meeting between the Queen and Truss was released to the media, depicting a seemingly composed monarch. However, with the benefit of hindsight, observers could discern subtle signs of frailty, particularly in the Queen's diminutive stature, and questions were raised about the extensive bruising on her hands. Medical experts suggested that these marks indicated recent disconnection from intravenous lines. At the time of its publication, few entertained the idea that this photograph foreshadowed the imminent demise of the monarch. The official handover on Tuesday, though brief, was a significant event. Boris Johnson's arrival at 11.16 a.m. and departure at 11.55 a.m. marked the end of his tenure, while Liz Truss took charge arriving at 12.22 p.m. and leaving at 12.55 p.m. The efficiency of the transition process belied the profound secret that surrounded the Queen's failing health. Behind closed doors, she had been grappling with significant health challenges for an extended period, far longer than the public had been aware. In the days leading up to her unexpected demise, Queen Elizabeth II engaged in activities that, on the surface, seemed incongruous with the notion of imminent death. One notable event was the investiture of her long-standing communications secretary, Donald McCabe, with the insignia of a lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order. Remarkably, 
McCabe stands as the last person to have received a formal honor from the Queen, adding a poignant layer to the historical significance of this gesture. The Queen, known for her sense of duty and commitment to her role, appeared to be conducting her responsibilities with characteristic gravity. However, these actions were far from typical for someone with the foreknowledge of impending death. A source, shedding light on the Queen's concealed health struggles, disclosed to the Daily Beast. The secret of her failing health was well guarded, but she had actually been very unwell for a lot longer than most people knew. Behind the regal facade, the Queen battled chronic health issues, enduring periods of intense pain. Her eyesight and hearing were deteriorating, and she grappled with frequent bouts of confusion. Movement became a formidable challenge, necessitating the use of a wheelchair for a significant portion of her final days. The juxtaposition of these profound health challenges, with the public image of the Queen being on her feet and actively engaging in official duties, such as the meeting with Liz Truce, created a deceptive veneer of normalcy. In Queen Elizabeth II's reign, a somber revelation emerged, shedding light on the monarch's silent battle with a formidable adversary, bone cancer. A source, confiding in the Daily Beast before her passing, disclosed this distressing diagnosis, a revelation later affirmed by her close friend and biographer, Giles Brandreth, in the aftermath of her death. The disclosure unveiled a poignant chapter in the Queen's life, marked by resilience in the face of a formidable and often excruciating health challenge. Bone cancer, known for its agonizing nature, brings with it a myriad of physical and emotional burdens. The condition frequently manifests in intense pain, a relentless companion that demands profound strength to endure. The mainstay of care for individuals grappling with bone cancer is often palliative, focusing on mitigating pain and enhancing overall quality of life. This approach typically involves administering powerful painkillers in substantial doses, a regimen that, regrettably, can introduce a disorientating effect. As the Queen navigated the complexities of bone cancer, she became acquainted with the dual realities of physical suffering and the challenges posed by the medications meant to alleviate her anguish. The disorientating impact of powerful painkillers added an additional layer of complexity to her daily life, testing not only her physical fortitude but also her mental resilience. The revelation of her bone cancer diagnosis contextualizes the Queen's actions in the days leading up to her death. Her dedication to official duties, the investiture of Donald McCabe, and the meeting with Liz Truss all occurred against the backdrop of a silent battle with a debilitating illness. The Queen's ability to maintain a public facade while grappling with the relentless pain of bone cancer underscores the depth of her commitment to her role and her people. As Queen Elizabeth II grappled with her declining health and the unexpected acceleration of her passing at Balmoral Castle, another royal drama unfolded in London. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, having arrived in the UK just days before, were embroiled in their own whirlwind of activities. The couple attended the One Young World Awards ceremony in Manchester on Monday, September 5th, and the following day, as the Queen fulfilled her constitutional duties for the last time, they jetted off to Dusseldorf to launch the one-year countdown to the Invictus Games. Their brief sojourn in Germany was cut even shorter, as Prince Harry was scheduled to attend the Wellchild Awards in London on Thursday. Meanwhile, in Windsor, Prince William and Kate, who had recently relocated to Adelaide Cottage on the Windsor Estate, found themselves in close proximity to Frogmore Cottage, the Sussex's British residence. The geographical proximity, however, was overshadowed by the familial tension between Prince Harry and Prince William, which had become a public spectacle. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were not only trying to navigate their own royal responsibilities, but also faced the challenge of getting their children settled into a new local school. The pages of newspapers were filled with the latest chapters of the ongoing Harry William saga, capturing the attention of the public and amplifying the underlying family tensions. 
Despite the tumultuous dynamics within the royal family, there was no discernible urgency in their actions that suggested imminent concern for the queen's health. Contrary to expectations, there was no swift pilgrimage to Balmoral, a response that might have been anticipated if the gravity of the queen's condition had been fully grasped. Late on a fateful Wednesday afternoon, the first tangible indication that all was not well emerged, as the palace quietly announced that Queen Elizabeth II, after a full day on Tuesday, would not be participating in the scheduled virtual Privy Council meeting that evening. However, the Queen had developed a pattern of cancelling less crucial engagements, a routine that had become somewhat expected, and thus the news slipped by almost unnoticed in the public eye. Behind the scenes, a well-sourced report in The Guardian unveiled a subtle yet significant detail. Simon Case, the cabinet secretary known for his excellent connections with the royal family, having previously served as William's private secretary, had received a tip-off about the Queen's imminent demise. This inside knowledge held by someone with close ties to the royals added a layer of insight into the gravity of the Queen's health. Curiously, Despite these behind-the-scenes whispers, the royal family did not exhibit outward signs of concern. There was no conspicuous rush to Balmoral, the queen's residence in times of retreat and repose, as might have been anticipated if her health were perceived to be in grave peril. This apparent nonchalance and the absence of a coordinated family response sparked speculation and gave rise to alternative theories. One prevailing theory, subscribed to by some insiders, posits that the royal family was indeed aware of the queen's imminent passing. However, their primary objective was not to be physically present at the moment of her death, but rather to avert unnecessary speculation and media frenzy. In essence, it was a strategic decision to keep calm and carry on, preserving a semblance of normalcy amid an impending loss. While differing perspectives abound, most sources agree that events unfolded with unexpected speed. The juxtaposition of seemingly routine cancellations, insider tips, and the family's composed demeanor belied the accelerated pace at which the final chapter of Queen Elizabeth II's storied reign played out. On that pivotal Wednesday evening at Balmoral, Princess Anne found herself in the solemn company of her ailing mother, Queen Elizabeth II. She was the sole family member present at the royal residence during that crucial time, a poignant precursor to the whirlwind of events that would unfold in the hours to come. Anne's presence took on an additional layer of significance when, as mentioned earlier, she briefly left the property on Thursday morning only to hasten back, sensing the urgency that hung in the air. Meanwhile, Prince Charles, the heir to the throne, was situated in Scotland, approximately four hours away, by car at Dumfries House. He and his wife Camilla were hosting NBC's Jenna Bush Hager, who had flown in for a scheduled TV interview with Camilla the following day. Charles's proximity to Balmoral made it logistically feasible for him to be by his mother's side that Wednesday evening, if there were genuine concerns about the Queen's well-being. However, the unfolding drama appeared inconspicuous, and Charles, hosting Jenna Bush Hager for dinner at Dumfries' house, gave no indication of an impending family crisis. NBC's journalist later recounted the evening in an interview on the Today Show, highlighting the seemingly serene atmosphere. It was a lovely meal, Jenna Bush Hager shared with Hoda Kot, reflecting on the dinner she attended. She relayed Charles' sentiment, mentioning that he expressed regret on behalf of Camilla, who couldn't make it due to a delayed flight. The lighthearted moment emerged when Charles referred to his wife as his darling, a detail that amused Jenna Bush Hager and prompted her to jokingly request the same endearment from her own husband. We had a wonderful evening filled with conversation that felt joyful, Jenna Bush Hager recounted, describing the ambiance as one of relaxation and happiness. As the night unfolded, everyone retired to bed seemingly unaware of the momentous 24 hours that awaited them. 
the apparent calmness and normalcy of that Wednesday evening, as described by Jenna Bush Hager, stood in stark contrast to the imminent upheaval that would soon engulf the royal family with the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. The serene facade of that evening belied the tumultuous events that would unfold in the wake of the Queen's departure. The calm facade of the previous evening's dinner was shattered on Thursday morning, ushering in a stark reality that something was gravely amiss. Reports indicated that a royal helicopter was hastily dispatched from Windsor at 6.48 a.m., presumably en route to collect Prince Charles and transport him urgently to Balmoral. Charles, captured by photographers, was seen boarding the helicopter, and it touched down at Balmoral at 10.27 a.m. Jenna Bush Hager, recounting the unfolding events, provided an intriguing timeline that hinted at the urgency of the situation. While she may have been grappling with jet lag, she narrated her perspective on the morning's events. The next morning we were setting up the interview. The interview was supposed to start around 2 or 2.30. I was supposed to meet with the now queen consort around 1.30. At 12.30 we heard sort of running up and down the halls. As the preparations for the scheduled interview were underway, the atmosphere shifted abruptly. Bush Hager's recollection continued. Their team came in and said, Can you please be quiet? There's a call. We were right by Charles's office. They said, He's on a call. Can you please be quiet? Then, all of a sudden, we heard a helicopter. The sudden and unexpected change in plans became apparent when Camilla had to postpone the interview. The revelation came through a message from the team. They said, the queen is ill, and they have gone and rushed off to be with her. We just said, our hearts are with them. As the night gave way to Thursday morning, the severity of the queen's health took a sudden and drastic turn, prompting an urgent response from those in the inner circles of power. Key government and establishment figures were informed of the distressing news, setting in motion a series of critical actions. Shortly after 12 noon, amidst the corridors of power in the House of Parliament, notes were discreetly passed to pivotal figures, including Prime Minister Liz Truss and Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition Labour Party. The message conveyed the gravity of the situation, compelling them to leave the chamber. At 12.32 p.m., Buckingham Palace officially communicated the concerning news. The Queen's doctors are concerned for Her Majesty's health and have recommended she remain under medical supervision. The Queen remains comfortable and at Balmoral. This carefully worded statement offered a glimpse into the gravity of the Queen's condition, emphasizing the need for close medical attention while assuring the public of her comfort at Balmoral. The BBC, with the nation on edge, turned to Hugh Edwards, who, dressed in a black tie, assumed the solemn responsibility of announcing the news to the general public. His somber delivery conveyed the gravity of the moment, as the nation collectively absorbed the reality of Queen Elizabeth II's deteriorating health. The transition from the relative quietude of a normal morning to the urgency of passing notes in the corridors of power and the formal announcement from Buckingham Palace mirrored the seismic shift that had occurred in the span of a few short hours. As the news of Queen Elizabeth II's deteriorating health reverberated through the corridors of power and the public consciousness, Buckingham Palace made a poignant announcement at 12.50 p.m., revealing that Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, and Sophie, Countess of Wessex, were en route to Scotland. This marked a critical moment, as the urgency of the situation prompted the mobilization of key members of the royal family to be by the Queen's side in her time of need. The anticipated rapid deployment of a military jet, scheduled to take off at 1.30 p.m., would have whisked the royal entourage to Balmoral with the expediency the situation demanded. However, the reality was marked by an unexpected delay, and the military jet, reportedly designated for this purpose, didn't take off until 2.40 p.m. The discrepancy in timing heightened the intrigue surrounding the unfolding events and hinted at a behind-the-scenes complexity. Insight into the cause of this delay emerged through a military source who revealed to the Daily Beast 
that a familial dispute was at the heart of the holdup. The royal family, already navigating the emotional and logistical challenges of Queen Elizabeth's health crisis, found themselves embroiled in a disagreement. The source disclosed that the discord was triggered by a suggestion from Prince Harry. Controversially, Harry proposed that both he and Meghan Markle be included on the plane destined for Scotland. The mere mention of Harry's suggestion reportedly stirred outrage within the family. The implication of including Harry and Meghan, given the recent controversies and tensions within the royal household, became a contentious point of discussion. This internal dispute not only contributed to the delay in the jet's departure, but also hinted at the underlying familial dynamics that persisted even in the face of a shared concern for the ailing monarch. As the urgency to be by Queen Elizabeth II's side intensified, the internal dynamics of the royal family, already fraught with tension, took center stage. Notably, the strained relations between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle on one side and the rest of the family, particularly Prince William, on the other, played a pivotal role in the unfolding events. At the time, the controversial Netflix show Harry and Meghan had not yet aired, and Harry's bombshell memoir had not been published. However, the acrimony between the Sussexes and the royal family, especially Prince William, was already palpable. The atmosphere was described as insane, with Harry seemingly holding the impending memoir and the Netflix series as leverage over the family. The depth of the rift was exemplified in Harry's request to Prince William for a lift to Scotland. In his memoir, Harry recounted reaching out to William, seemingly seeking a shared journey to be by their grandmother's side during this critical moment. However, a friend of William's revealed to the Daily Beast the incredulity and strain behind this seemingly straightforward request. They had just spent two years slagging off the entire family and calling them racists the friend stated. Harry had completely betrayed William, and he was holding the memoir, published after the Queen's death, and the Netflix series over them as well. They hadn't exchanged a cordial word in months, and then he is texting him saying, can we get a lift with you? I think if it had just been Harry, maybe a way could have been found. But Meghan too? Er, no thanks. As tensions within the royal family reached a critical juncture, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's actions served to further intensify the unfolding drama. In a move that both infuriated and heightened the stakes, the Sussexes instructed their team to publicly announce not only their absence from the Well Child Awards, but also their intention to go to Balmoral, the Queen's residence in Scotland. This announcement struck a nerve within the royal circle. A former palace staffer, Shedding light on the intricacies of royal protocol, remarked to the Daily Beast, You need an invite to go to Balmoral at any time, let alone a moment of massive constitutional upheaval. The decision to publicly declare their intention to join the family in Scotland was perceived as a bold move, considering the delicate circumstances and the fact that Meghan Markle wasn't traditionally included in such family matters. The former palace staffer added, they knew Meghan wasn't wanted. No one had replied to their messages. No one had invited her to come. Kate, who had known the Queen for decades, wouldn't have dreamed of being there on her deathbed. But for some reason, Meghan wanted to insert herself into it. So they tried to bounce the future King into accepting it by publicly announcing it. However, the Sussexes' plan, if it indeed aimed to pressure acceptance, did not succeed. The moment Prince Charles caught wind of Harry and Meghan's statement, he recognized the need to take decisive action. Charles, aware of the potential disruption Meghan's presence could cause, called Harry and delivered a clear message. Meghan was not to be brought to Balmoral. In Harry's own words, we told our team to confirm we'd be missing the Wellchild Awards and hurrying up to Scotland.
Then came another call from Pa. He said I was welcome at Balmoral, but he didn't want her. He started to lay out his reason, which was nonsensical and disrespectful, and I wasn't having it. Don't ever speak about my wife that way. Tension escalated, and Charles, recognizing the gravity of the situation, began to explain his rationale. In Harry's account, Charles stammered, offering an apologetic tone, explaining that he preferred fewer people around. He cited the absence of other spouses, including Kate, as a precedent for Meghan not attending. Harry, however, rejected this explanation, asserting that Charles could have simply said, no other wives were coming, Kate wasn't coming, therefore Meg shouldn't. Then that's all you needed to say. In the timeline presented by Harry, this unseemly argument concluded by mid-afternoon. At this point, he had not received any response from William regarding his earlier text requesting a lift. With the uncertainty surrounding his travel plans, Harry made the decision to charter a private plane. Intriguingly, a military source conveyed to the Daily Beast that the Royal Air Force RAF jet carrying William, Edward, Sophie, and Andrew sat on the tarmac at Northolt Airport for up to an hour before taking off at 2.40 p.m. The source suggested that the delay may have stemmed from uncertainty about whether Harry was expected on the plane. This detail added a layer of complexity to the unfolding narrative, showcasing the intricacies and miscommunications that marked this crucial moment for the royal family. As the final moments of Queen Elizabeth II's life unfolded, conflicting details emerged regarding the precise time of her passing. One source shared with the Daily Beast that the Queen drew her last breath at 2.37 p.m. However, this detail need not necessarily conflict with the official time registered on the death certificate, which noted 3.10 p.m. as the official time of death. The official time is typically when the death is medically certified, and it is believed that only Princess Anne and Prince Charles were present in the room with the Queen at the exact moment of her passing. This nuance raises an intriguing possibility regarding the timing of events surrounding the royal jet. If the Queen had indeed passed away at 2.37 p.m., it suggests that those on the plane might have been notified of her death during the journey. Realizing that there was no longer a need to wait for any additional passengers, as they would have missed the opportunity to say their farewells, the decision to order wheels up could have been made. The jet carrying Prince William, Prince Edward, Sophie, Countess of Wessex, and Prince Andrew arrived at Balmoral before the official announcement of the Queen's death was made at 6.30 p.m. This timeline presented the possibility that, during the journey, news of the Queen's passing prompted the expedited arrival of the royal party. However, Prince Harry, who had chosen to charter a private plane, experienced a different sequence of events. According to Harry, he received a breaking news alert from the BBC announcing his grandmother's death when he came in for a landing. The palace, however, contested this version, asserting that Harry had been informed before the news organizations. The conflicting accounts, even on a matter as significant as the timing of the announcement of the Queen's passing, highlighted the extraordinary level of discord between Harry and the palace. As Prince Harry arrived at Balmoral following the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, the atmosphere became even more charged with tension and humiliation. In a stark display of the strained relations within the royal family, Prince Charles and Prince William were conspicuously absent, having retreated to Charles's house on the estate, Burke Hall, for a private dinner. The new monarch and heir apparently chose to dine privately, leaving Harry to share a meal with what he referred to as the B-team at Balmoral. Princess Anne, Prince Edward, and the disgraced Prince Andrew. In his memoir, Harry recounted the experience, noting that the quickest way back would have been to get a lift with Pa or Willie. However, he ended up booking his own seat on his phone in the night. While the memoir doesn't explicitly state why he chose not to ask for a lift, the day's humiliations and arguments likely contributed to his decision.
the fractured relationships within the family were laid bare, as the traditional support and camaraderie that might be expected during such a sensitive time were notably absent. The Queen's body lay in her bedroom at Balmoral overnight on Thursday, and on Saturday it was placed in a lead-lined coffin and moved to the Balmoral ballroom. Family, estate staff, and local friends were invited to pay tribute during this period. On Sunday, the coffin was carried out of the ballroom by the estate's gamekeepers, embarking on a circuitous six-hour route through Scotland, a final journey through the Queen's beloved landscapes. Unlike the chaotic events on the day of her death, the subsequent plans for the mourning period unfolded with precision. The week of mourning culminated in an extraordinary spectacle in London, as Queen Elizabeth's body was pulled through the streets on a gun carriage by hundreds of members of the armed forces. The meticulous execution of these plans may have brought a sense of relief to those involved, particularly considering the disorder and discord that marked the initial hours following the Queen's passing. In the face of the monarch's commitment to punctuality and precision, the restoration of order would likely have been a fitting tribute to her legacy. What do you think about Queen Elizabeth Thou's ill-fated day? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.